Hello and welcome back. Now, nearly a third of today's professional footballers are black, but it wasn't always like that. For those who came before today's stars, like Daniel Sturridge or Marcus Rashford, racism was often their toughest opponent. In the 1970s, it was part of life both on and off the football pitch. Well, broadcaster and lifelong West Bromwich Albion fan Adrian Charles has been looking at the subject, morning to you, morning. Um, for a documentary which is fascinating. We're just going to have a little look right now. When did you see the red mist over monkey chant, a banana being thrown, whatever horrors you had to go through? How did you deal with it? Did you ignore it? Could you hear do you know, it? Do you know the funny... Yes. When I'm on the pitch, when I was on the pitch, I heard everything. You heard every chant and every racial chant you definitely heard. Sometimes, when I was getting the abuse, I felt isolated in so much as the, um, the opposition players would be giving me stick. But my teammates were laughing. I was at Leicester City, and the Leicester fans were racially abusing other black players. I cannot, for the life of me, see how they can racially abuse other players and it not affect me. And I remember the manager had a dig at me. Oh, Bob, they're just very small-minded people. Ignore them. I said, you ignore them, yeah? Because you can ignore them. But I says, me, I'm out there, I feel it. You can see I'm getting a little bit yeah. worked up now, can't you? <laughs> but that's how I felt about it. I felt completely let down by them. There's some really powerful interviews in the piece. And as I suppose the, the pin for the documentary is this match that takes place in the late 1970s, which is white players taking on black players, which just seems absolutely mad now in 2016 yeah it does it does doesn't it it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing but what's extraordinary about it is then i think and i've done plenty of research and spoke mm. to loads of people i think it was felt to be progressive somehow but you know the, the world moved on but in that context amidst all that kind of racial hatred the, the, the few black players who were playing the game at the time in this country and in the in 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 that context of all the racial hatred they were getting you know, something, some, a bit of, you know, a bit of bad, something not being in the best possible taste, like mm. a black versus white match, was, you know, what wasn't something to fuss about. They were very, they were very proud of it. And interestingly, the white players who played that game can't really remember it. Someone said, I think I've played. I've, I don't know, it was kind of just another game. For them, it was massive. They all said about the dressing room, don't forget, all their lives, they'd always been in a minority in the dressing mm. room, mm. one or two of them in the dressing room. Now they had a dressing room all of their own you know they've all told me how special how special that felt and um, so many interesting interviews you also talked didn't you to some of the uh, players wives and girlfriends when they talked um, you know obviously difficult for the players but as well for them as well wasn't it yeah, everybody had a different way of a way of dealing with it I mean Brendan Batson's um, late wife Cicely was a lovely woman I've, I've met her several times remember Brendan saying she came once, and I'm never coming again. I just can't yeah. stand it, Brendan. It's awful. But then um, Bob Hazel's wife, Joy, a lovely woman, you, it was Bob you just saw talking there, getting very emotional. Said, no, I just wanted to be there. But it was a lonely place. You know, you walked in, you know, but, you know boredom, but he stayed places now. You know, you talk to Les Ferdinand, who's, who's director of football at QPI, he said, you know, I don't see another black person from one week to the next mm. in, in, the, in the boardrooms now, so let alone then. But, she, you know, she just wanted to be there. And you're a particularly happy West Brom fan this morning after your four 0 win last night. But you yeah. were on the terraces back then as well. So what what was it like for for black football fans watching those games? Back I, th there? I think that's what I've learned more than anything from doing this. It, it, to, to my shame, it hadn't really occurred to me what black fans went through, you know. And you know, you think of players horrendous they was from. They're outnumbered on the pitch at least, you know, ten to one or twenty to one. Those black fans I spoke to outnumbered. To twenty, you know, twenty thousand to one. Mm. There's one guy said to me, a guy called Bernie Knoll, who's a prison officer, and he said, "I preferred the seventies." A black guy to follow us then. He said, "I prefer the seventies." So what do you mean? He said, "Because then you knew who the racists were." He said, "You looked around. You can see who's throwing the bananas and making the monkey noises." Now I don't know. I look around. I thought, well, some of you are maybe still thinking those things, but I don't know who's who. No. Look, Nobody, least of all mm. Bernie, would say things haven't improved, you know, immeasurably. But I thought that was an interesting, an interesting point of view. Still very few black fans, as you know, proportionally. Mm. You know, a, a third of players are black. As sure as anything, a third of fans are black. 
another thing stream that comes out of it is that uh, back in those days there was a sort of planned you know they would plant people in some stands to yeah. sort of get the chanting going mm. I don't want to you know I don't want to give the, the National Front too much credit as being a you know a, a, a very well sort of organized institution but I was amazed how sophisticated it turned out their operation was there was a National Front guy in Birmingham a Birmingham City fan who mm. said he was recruited as a kid uh, by the National Front and they were strategically put little pockets of them in, a, in one of the ends at, at Birmingham. I forget what the, um, what, what the big sort of the yeah. terraces at Birmingham. They're in one corner, another corner, another corner, another corner, somebody in the middle. And mm -hmm. then at a given time, 15 minutes in, they'd start making monkey noises and then everybody would join in. So in a way, it sort of gave me hope. So it wasn't sort of spontaneous chanting, you know, it was yeah. sort of organised. But, you know, they should go to Birmingham Market and get crate loads of bananas and hand them out outside the ground. It's, 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 this was our, our life, our, was it our lifetime? You're probably younger than me, <laughs> but it was certainly in my life. Yeah, and that's what makes it so fascinating to watch. And you've spoken to the modern day footballer as well, the likes of Ian Wright featuring the documentary. Yeah, I mean, Ian is very generous and, and Dion Dublin, who I spoke to and just said, you know, you know what, we, we owe them so much. We owe them so much. And the way, the way he puts it is, you know, they had to turn the other cheek. Although George Berry and Bob Hazel weren't so much like that. They were more like the Angry Brigade. But with Cyril and Brendan, said they were, as, as Ian puts it, they were like Martin Luther King. He said, Ian Wright said, my generation, I, I was more like Malcolm X. You know, I, I, was, I, was, I was angry, but I was allowed to be angry because mm. of what Cyril and Brendan and, and the late great Laurie Cunningham had been through before. Right. Um, it's a really um, in intriguing watch Thank and quite shocking, much. some of it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, white versus Blacks, How Football Changed the Nation is on BBC Two this Sunday at 9pm. That is all from us. We should be back tomorrow from 6, so join us for that. Uh, now time, though, for the next episode of the new series of Ill-Gotten Gains. Let's hand over to Angelica Bell and Rav Wilding.